Roundtable Osteuropa. Ein Podcast des Zentrums für Osteuropa und internationale Studien. Thirty years ago, on the 1st of December 1991, more than 90% of Ukrainian voters voted for the country's independence with a turnout of more than 80%. The referendum validated a decision taken in August 1991 by the Supreme Soviet of the Ukrainian SSR, which adopted the Declaration of Independence of Ukraine in the aftermath of the failed August coup by communist hardliners who tried to regain control and restore central communist party control. The Ukrainian parliament called for a referendum to express the public support for independence, which then took place on the 1st of December 1991. On that same day, the first direct presidential elections in the country took place. And as a result, Leonid Kravchuk became the first president of independent Ukraine on the 5th of December 1991. The Declaration of Independence in August and its public approval by referendum are yet another decisive watershed moment for Ukraine and all of Soviet history in this decisive year of 1991. Given the importance in economic and political terms of Ukraine in the Soviet Union, after the referendum, it was clear that the survival of the Soviet Union had become unrealistic. And indeed, one week after the election, Kravchuk joined his Russian and Belarusian counterparts to sign the Belaveja Accords, declaring that the USSR had ceased to exist and established at its place the Commonwealth of Independent States. As we now know, on 26th of December 1991, the USSR was then dissolved. To this day, the Ukrainian independence of 1991 leaves a contested legacy. And the memory of 1991 itself is complicated, to say the least. Memories differ within today's Ukraine, and memories have changed over time. The events of 1991 are entwined with contested questions of national identity and territorial sovereignty. And I'm delighted to have two wonderful speakers today to discuss the question of the independence and its aftermath and what it means for Ukraine to this day. So I'm joined by Gwendolyn Sasse and Serhi Plochy. Serhi joins us from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he's professor of Ukrainian history and also the director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. He has extensively published on questions related to the intellectual, cultural, and international history of Eastern Europe. And he has an emphasis in his research on Ukraine, but it also goes beyond. It's very nice to have you with us today on the podcast. Welcome, Serhi. Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And my second speaker is Gwendolyn Sasse. Gwendolyn is the director of the Center for East European and International Studies, and she's also the Einstein Professor for the Comparative Study of Democracy and Authoritarianism at Humboldt University, Berlin. She has published extensively on Ukrainian politics, and she's got a particular research interest relating to regional dynamics in Ukraine. Very nice to have you on the podcast, Gwendolyn. Thanks, Felix. My name is Felix Kravacek. I'm leading the research cluster on youth in Eastern Europe here at Zeus and I'll guide you through the discussion. So to begin with, I wanted to give you the word, Serhi, to bring us some context for the relevance of the events of 1991. How critical was Ukraine's role in the breakup of the Soviet Union? Um, as you mentioned, uh, on December 1st, 1991, Ukrainians voted overwhelmingly for independence of their country. So that was the question on the ballot. The question was not whether the Soviet Union should be gone or not, but it happened that within a few days or few weeks after the Ukrainian referendum, the Soviet Union was dissolved. And the question is why? The answer uh, was given by uh, President of Russia, Boris Yeltsin, in 1991 to President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, when Yeltsin told Bush that the Soviet Union was impossible without Ukraine because Russia would be outnumbered and outvoted by the Muslim republics in the future union without Ukraine. Uh, it's uh, one of the way to look at those things, putting uh, forward cultural issues and cultural sensitivities of Russians. But uh, Ukraine was the second largest republic of the Soviet Union in terms of its population, in terms of its economic output and contribution to the union coffers. 
So Russia at the end decided that the Soviet Union as an enterprise was not worth continuing without the second largest partner. And if you look today at the headlines in the newspapers today related to the escalation in the Russo-Ukrainian war happening at this point, it is very clear that Russia's plans, Putin's plans for some form of reintegration of the post-Soviet space without Ukraine are really, really not viable. So that is, Ukraine continues to be an important factor of the regional politics as the second largest republic after the Soviet Union. After, after. Mm. And some people have pointed out also the role of, of the Chernobyl nuclear power incidents um, that happened in Ukraine. That seems to, kind of, for many of us here in the West, have been a key moment of the 1980s. And I know that you've worked on, on that question as well. I mean, What do you think, in your assessment, how how important was that accident and how it was dealt with for the desire of Ukrainians to gain independence? Mm -hmm. Thank you for this question. Uh, Chernobyl uh, accident of April 26, 1986 played an extremely important role in the history of the Soviet Union, late Soviet Union, and the history of Ukraine. With Chernobyl accident, the mobilization, uh, uh, so-called eco-nationalist mobilization, started in the Soviet Union. It started very interestingly, not with Ukraine, but with Lithuania, uh, which had one of the Soviet nuclear power plants on its territory, the Ignalina nuclear power plant. That's actually the site where the HBO Chernobyl miniseries were done. The, the rise of the Baltic resistance to the central control is closely associated with mobilization over the issues of nuclear energy. Nuclear energy was uh, perceived in the republics as an example of the imperial interference, the, the instrument of empire in the regions where the empire was getting resources out of, of the region but was living the republics, the countries, the provinces, to deal with the consequences of the disasters. And in Ukraine, you see that the first, first mobilization happening around the issue of, issues of Chernobyl, issues of ecology. In that mobilization are the roots of the Ukrainian movement for independence, uh, the, the organization that was called Ruch. So it would be really difficult or impossible to imagine Ukraine you know, being mobilized against the Soviet Union without, without Chernobyl. And we just talked about the importance of Ukraine overall when it comes to the fate of the USSR in 1991. So Chernobyl is a very important part of that story. And is that because of the accident as such or because of the way it was dealt with in the aftermath? This is an excellent question. I would put emphasis on the way how it was dealt with and mismanaged, in particular when it comes to the uh, issues of information and informing the population about the dangers. Those problems were there from the start go, the delayed um, evacuation of the city of Pripyat. 50,000 people were there held for more than 24 hours in the close proximity to the reactor. And then everything was actually classified. Everything was considered to be top secret. And the mobilization that started in Ukraine, like uh, also in, to a degree in Belarus, but to a lesser degree, was around the issue of please tell us the truth about Chernobyl. Please show us the map. We want to know whether we live in the area that was affected by the fallout after Chernobyl or not. We want to know whether we are safe and our children are safe or not. And that kind of demand, it crossed all sorts of lines between party members and non-party members, between uh, elites and, and, and working class and, and farmers. So that was really the foundation for national mobilization. Oh, that's interesting. Also, that moment of building cross-cutting coalitions around around that disaster and, and cross-national. Gwen, I wanted to bring you in, kind of moving to the situation in 1991 and that moment of the declaration of independence and the transition that followed. Um, could you sketch for us, um, in your opinion, what were the main tasks ahead of that newly independent Ukrainian state? 
Yes, thanks, Felix. As you mentioned at the beginning, the actual declaration of independence came in the aftermath of the August coup um, already on the 24th of August 1991. And then, of course, this democratic legitimation of this declaration followed on the 1st of December. And I think that is a very important step because it meant there had also been a momentum domestically and internationally building behind this idea of Ukrainian independence. And of course, it also increased expectations in society and among elites as well. But we'll probably talk about that a little later on. So I think the first big task was recognition of independence. And that means both domestically inside, but also internationally. And the Ukrainian Soviet leadership already in the run up to the referendum intensified contacts, international contacts. And right after the referendum, Ukrainian independence was recognized by Poland, Canada, and also, as Serhiy already mentioned, uh, by the Russian president, Boris Yeltsin. That was also important for what came next. And then um, a whole range of, of other countries followed. But that international recognition um, was important. But I would also say that that is not only a matter of the legal recognition. And Ukraine had to um, take its place on the international scene, but also on the mental map of, of Europe. And that took much longer and arguably is a process that's still going on today. And on the one hand, I think this means that in, in Europe generally, um, we still can, can often find a discourse that doesn't separate clearly between Russia and Ukraine or knows, in my view, too little about um, independent Ukraine. And of course, the, the extreme in this discussion is, of course, uh, Russia's position today on, on Ukraine and Russia's difficulty or inability to accept Ukrainian independence and to accept the Ukrainian nation as separate from the, from the Russian nation. And we've seen this year President Putin issuing his own um, historical narratives about Ukraine and Ukraine's position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia or Russian culture. And of course, we, we, we saw the Crimean annexation in 2014, and we, we see an ongoing war in eastern Ukraine where Russia supports um, local separatists, and without Russia, this war would not be ongoing. So these are massive challenges to this idea of recognizing uh, Ukrainian independence and that task, which was, which was tangible from December onwards, 1991, is still going on. And in many ways, we see kind of this long shadow of, of the empire there because the conditions uh, in, in Ukrainian-Russian relations were more favorable um, from the Ukrainian perspective under, under Yeltsin and in the 1990s than they are today. And the second process that goes hand in hand um, with the recognition of independence at the time is, of course, the formal dissolution of the USSR with the Belovizhia Accords and the formal dissolution at the end of 1991. But the formal dissolution uh, didn't end the deep uh, Soviet era ties between Soviet republics and, and not only now between Ukraine and, and Russia across the Soviet Union in particular, economic linkages, infrastructure, transit routes, all of this made economic um, transition in particular, but also political transition hard at times and came at high costs also to the Ukrainian population. So Ukraine is an example of a very difficult economic transition for which uh, society paid a high price if we think of hyperinflation and and so on. And the, the Soviet era economic model that was ingrained in, in the Ukrainian economic structures to some extent still is today, uh, was a very difficult starting point. If we think of Soviet era heavy industry, um, producing um, on the basis of subsidized energy and raw material supplies, uh, manufactured goods that, however, were made for a Soviet market. And all of this became entangled or disentangled and, and made for big challenges. A part of the dissolution process was, of course, also the fact or the, the, the challenge that there were nuclear weapons stationed on Ukrainian territory. This was Ukraine agreed to transferring these weapons to Russia in return for the 1994 Budapest agreement in the memorandum that also the US and the UK signed. Ukraine agreed to give up the nuclear weapons in return for, for a recognition of its territorial integrity. Uh, we now know since 2014, at least this, this uh, treaty, this agreement is null and void. So again, a long, long shadow of the um, imperial past there. And if we enter it sort of maybe as a, as a different way of, of summing up the, the tasks that, that Ukraine really faced, I think it, it is an example of, of a Soviet, former Soviet Republic that faced the simultaneity of the what is often described as a triple transition. There is a the challenge of a political transition. Uh, there's a challenge of an economic transition. And on top of that, a considerable challenge to build and rebuild 
build again the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian nation. And while that in Western perception is often reduced to uh, simple ethnic and linguistic criteria, nevertheless, the historically grown regional diversity of Ukraine was a big challenge in this regard and is still today. And Crimea is, was the main territorial challenge already in the 1990s. However, a challenge that was managed and managed peacefully at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So I wanted to spend a bit more time discussing with you this, the issue of nation building and returning it to Serhi because Gwen has already brought it up. And part, of course, of the process of nation building is having a shared historical narrative, a story to tell to your people of why you are now in these state borders. And when Ukraine gained independence in 1991, that was for the first time in these borders. And Therefore, the challenge, like in other post-Soviet successor states, was to find a way back in a way, how to how to found your national history. And so we can see in Ukrainian historical narratives kind of an, an attempt to emphasize a long-standing struggle for independence historically. Um, and that all seems, if one looks at it cursory from the outside, incredibly complicated as a line of argumentation. Serhi, could you help us see a little bit clearer on that historical line of argumentation and the historical foundations of the idea of a Ukrainian nation? Uh, yes, Felix, uh, absolutely. Uh, back in 1995, uh, Slavic Review, the leading journal on the field, published a discussion, a debate under the title, Does Ukraine Have a History? And uh, the question was formulated by Mark von Hagen, uh, one of the leading uh, historians of the Soviet Union at the time and later. And the, uh, his argument was that, yes, Ukraine probably has a history, but does it have a history and historical narrative that would be recognized on the international arena? So this is going back to what uh, uh, Glenn was talking about. So that was a challenge, but uh, there was little challenge in terms of the explaining to the uh, population of Ukraine what was going on, because what happened was that the uh, traditional historical narrative of Ukraine that was put together in the late 19th and the beginning of the 20th century by people like Mikhail Hrushevsky was brought back into the center of the public attention. And that narrative set a claim, historical claim of Ukraine on Kiev and Rus, the, the medieval state that existed in that region that was centered on Kiev. And uh, the Ukrainian uh, Declaration for Independence that was voted by the parliament on uh, August 24th, 1991, was a very short one, but uh, the, the authors of the declaration found enough space to put the uh, argument that Ukraine was actually restoring or following in the long established tradition of state building. And the reference was most likely to the, to the Kiev and Rus, but not only, because the Declaration of Independence in August of 1991, that was the fifth attempt in the 20th century by different forces in Ukraine to declare and sustain independence of Ukraine. So again, the, the 1991 comes in the wake of this other numerous uh, attempts to establish independence. The longest period that Ukraine was independent one way or another, or at least independent from Russia, was uh, during and immediately after what is known in the West as the Russian as the Russian Revolution. So there was a number of successive governments. The most stable one turned out to be the government that was backed by Germany, and which raises the question how fully independent Ukraine was. But certainly, it was independent from Russia for a number for a number of months in 1918. What we witness today is certainly unprecedented in Ukrainian modern history. The independence doesn't last for a few days, like it was in 1939 with Carpathia and Ukraine, or for a few months, like it was in 1918 or 1919. It lasts now for 30 years, and that, that puts the country and the nation, of course, in a different place when, it, when, when, when we look at history. And the independence that has now lasted for 30 years, of course, has seen profound political shifts over these three decades and linked with that also always attempts to rearrange and to rewrite history. Staying with you, Serhi, could you periodize a little bit for us kind of the way historiography was used or how history was being rewritten over this period of three decades? What are those 
tendencies that we can identify there? Well, the first development that happened was really the return of the traditional national narrative associated with claim, Ukrainian exclusive claim for the legacy of Kiev and Rus, or something that was formulated by, uh, again, Mikhail Groshevsky. That's the person after whom my chair at Harvard, chair of Ukrainian history, is named. The creator of the traditional Ukrainian narrative, uh, historical narrative at the turn of the 20th century, and the head of the Ukrainian parliament in 1917 and 1918 that declared uh, Ukrainian independence in January of 1918, the first, the first case like that in the 20th century. So um, the, the 1990s was really about Hrushevsky and his narrative coming back and pushing aside the Soviet narrative, which was really Russo-centric, especially when it comes to the post-World War II period. But uh, once, once you move beyond the 1990s, you see a much more diversity in terms of interpretation of Ukrainian history. And the, this anti-communist camp of 1990s is now being split between group that is more traditionally nationalist and the group that is more liberal and is engaged in the renegotiating the place of Ukraine on the world historical map. So addressing the question that was posed by Mark von Hagen in that discussion in 1995 of whether Ukraine has a history. So it's the liberal group that goes out there to the world and tries to explain where Ukraine is, where Ukraine was, how it actually in, interacts with the history of Europe, with the history of the region, uh, including including the, the, the Soviet Soviet history and relation to the to other Soviet republics. So that is, in very general terms, the trajectory that we uh, we see today, and also a shift of a focus from the Ukrainian nation understood in ethnic terms to the Ukrainian nation understood in civic terms. And the events of 2014, 2015, the annexation of the Crimea, uh, Gwen referred to that, the, the uh, hybrid war in Donbass, showed that Ukraine actually survived because of its mobilization as a civic nation rather than an ethnic nation. And that, that certainly had a major impact on the discourse in the country and also on the way how historians look at history of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Um, so we've already touched on kind of the need for the deeper historical roots and how they were identified. And you've also already spoken about the need to kind of deal with the Soviet past. In 2015, there were a quartet of decommunization laws that were signed and they made headlines and they were very controversially discussed. Petro Poroshenko in these laws basically mandated that communist monuments were to be removed and um, public places were being renamed. And the criticism of these laws was that, well, it makes it illegal to publicly express views that many Ukrainians or a certain share of Ukrainians might hold. Another line of criticism was that it's a severe intervention into free speech. Serhi, what do you make of these, this quartet of decommunization laws from 2015? Um, uh, the, the main criticism, as far as I remember it, was that not really outlawing the monuments to Lenin or uh, some elements of the communist ideology. It was pretty much dead, at least on the territory of Ukraine, where the law applied. It didn't include by that time uh, Crimea and and good part of Donbass, where this well, Soviet nostalgia probably was the strongest. So I don't remember much criticism in that sense, but there was a lot of criticism, especially coming from the West, that the laws were promoting not just a ban on a certain manifestation of communist ideology, but it was promoting the nationalist or radical nationalist uh, elements of nationalist narrative. And that was, that was the main concern. So what we see today is that those um, uh, concerns or those uh, maybe fears were not, were not materialized, uh, which, again, in, in my opinion, tells more uh, about the Ukrainian society than about law itself. So, again, I think that was an important point in uh, Ukraine cutting its links and uh, and its umbilical cord to the to, to the Soviet history and to the Soviet past. Uh, it was done on the symbolic level, 
the Soviet legacy continues in many other other ways beyond, of course, history and beyond identity. It's present in history and identity, but certainly beyond that. And when referred to the infrastructure, including the uh, pipelines and other things, Ukraine, again, now in the news, not only because of the Russo-Ukrainian war, but because of the issues of Nord Stream 2. And what is what is at the center of that that discussion, despite the fact that it's not emphasized, is really what will happen to the old Soviet infrastructure providing gas to Europe in particular. So again, the Soviet legacy is still very important for Ukraine today. Mm. So let's now move to kind of 2021 and what happened in 2021 with 1991. Gwen, I wanted to give you the word. Can you tell us a little bit about how the events of 1991 were commemorated across Ukraine and maybe also what has changed compared to the, you know, now we are at the third decade anniversary, what has changed to the second decade's anniversary? If you could speak about that for us, that would be great. Yes, so the celebrations this year were, were certainly bigger than they had been in, in previous years and that had already been announced some years ago that also the 30th anniversary would be a bigger event. The national public holiday is the 24th of August, so the Declaration of Independence uh, of 1991 is, is commemorated thereby. And uh, a day earlier, so on the 23rd of August, that is the National Flag Day. So there's already uh, sort of almost a build up then to to the the actual commemoration of the Declaration of Independence. And yes, this this year it was a three day celebration. There were festivities across the country, in particular in Kiev, but uh, deliberately across the country. It was meant to be and, and signaled the unity in the country, and, and it goes to, towards that idea of a civic identity built and strengthened in Ukraine that Serhii just mentioned. A new type of award was uh, introduced by the president, by President Zelensky, the National Legends Awards. So a number of um, known people from the arts in particular got this award, Living Legends was the was the slogan used for that and then also very importantly Uh, the first Crimean platform took place. That is an initiative um, by the president that involves a lot of local national actors, but also invited um, international guests. And it tries to build the momentum to keep the focus on the annexation of Crimea and also possible scenarios or supports for scenarios to um, undo this annexation at, at some point. So um, this also had a very, very clear political message in, in this respect. Respect. And then also importantly, there was a significant military parade that accompanied the, the celebrations. Now, it was not the first year that this type of a parade has taken place, but in the context of an ongoing war and also accompanied, of course, with very clear statements by the political elites, in particular by the president about uh, Ukraine's security, its westward orientation, references to closer integration with the EU and NATO were made. So it was a, a clear signal of both where, where Ukraine is at at the moment, so the, the war became very present, but also it was meant to signal strength and also showcase um, a modernized army. So the war clearly had um, a reorientation also in, in the budget as one of its consequences or effects and, and a modernized army presented itself. Over the years, there have been military parades, but not every year. So it wasn't something Uh, entirely new, but the context now is is clearly within a war context, an important one. And maybe also to, to add to that, that foreign troops, in addition to inter international guests, also foreign troops uh, marched alongside Ukrainian troops and special operations forces. So there were, for example, there was participation from countries like Poland, the United States, Canada, and also uh, the British Royal Air Force participated in a flyover. So these are also important signals. One element that um, I found striking, but I would be interested to, to know what you make out of this, is if you look at opinion polls of what people would vote for today if they had the opportunity to vote once again this, on this question of independence, is that the number has shifted quite a bit. So we already said that back in December 1991, 92% voted for the independence of Ukraine. Now, depending a bit on how the question is phrased, we usually find a value of around 70%. I mean, what can we read into this shift, if anything, at all. Gwen, maybe would you want to? Yeah, sure. I think there hasn't been such an, a clear shift because I think it depends in these surveys and we would of course need to compare and, and see which ones we are, which data we're really looking at here. 
But I think it's uh, the the reference category is is important. So uh, if I look at the polls done by Keys, the Kiev International Institute of Sociology, then they came up with figures in June this year. Um, that are very similar to the figures of 1991. And I think the key difference is if we're talking about the population at large or the actual electorate that would take part in a referendum. And and what they found this year, and that is almost identical to 1991, is that uh, just over 78% of the population would take part in a referendum and just under 90% of those would vote for independence. So I think while there had been, in fact, a dip earlier. So if we look at these figures and compare them correctly, I mean, over the whole population, that, that figure, I think, of the 70% that you mentioned is, is, is correct. And then by 2021, that has gone, gone up a little. But um, if we look at the actual electorate, and that distinction also obviously had to be made for, for 1991. So there, the figure that we mentioned before, over 90% voted in favor of it, that is of the people who, who participated. And that was about 84%. So without being too technical, I think that matters. And I think the, the real dip was was earlier. So if we if we go back and if if I sort of look, for example, at the keys polls around 2015, 16, the overall figure had dipped. And I think that was a reflection, I would think, without having analyzed it in any particular detail, that that is a direct reflection of what happens in the aftermath of uh, the annexation of Crimea and a war going on, that that might might have an effect on, on this question of independence. But it seems more that we've come full circle. And, and as of 2021, I don't see a difference there. Okay, that's interesting. So we're back basically to where we were in 1991. Um, and maybe, Seri, you could develop another component of that kind of public view um, on how, how desired independence is. Another aspect that often stands out is the question of kind of regional fragmentation, um, kind of the Western parts being having a very different outlook on 1991 and, and the independence if compared to the South and the East of Ukraine. I mean, what what would you make out of this regional fragmentation that we sometimes encounter in, in the headlines when we read about Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Thank you. What is really interesting about independence and regionalism is that uh, in the vote of 1991 referendum vote, there was not much of a difference to a degree. The areas in the east of Ukraine in Donbass were voting 80% and more of the participants were supporting independence. So the, the national numbers were 91, 92 in Donbass, in eastern Ukraine, where the war is going on now, was between 82 and 83. Crimea was an outlier. There were 54 percent, it seems to me. But the rest of Ukraine was quite united. 1990s brought major changes to the, to the attitudes of uh, the population of Ukraine because independence was perceived as a something that once you declare it, the economic prosperity comes almost overnight. And the prosperity didn't come. The 1990s came with really enormous hardship. And that was closely linked to independence, and it was closely linked to the nostalgia for the Soviet Union. So 1990s are the lowest in terms of the uh, percentage of the population of Ukraine that would vote for independence, would support independence. It never uh, went beyond 50%. But it was during some years in that decade was a little bit above 50 percent. But uh, as, as already mentioned by Gwen, the, the war really, really mobilized the, the society as a whole. And um, it introduced a different, different attitude toward independence. Because if the numbers of 1991 are saying that, okay, a certain percentage of people were prepared or actually did go to vote and decided to support independence, the numbers of 2021, let's say, include also people who are not just supporting independence, but who are prepared to risk their lives and go and fight war for independence, which is a major, major change. Returning back to the to the issue of regionalism, the war changed a lot about Ukrainian regional uh, differences and divisions. It didn't eradicate them altogether, but it created a much more homogenous nation than was there before 2014. Elections, presidential elections before 2014 show us the map very often where Ukraine was split into the east and west. 
And the, the, the majority with which this or that president would come to power was really not significant. So it was like the United States of America. But, but also plus to that, there was a very clear regional, regional differences. When you look at the presidential elections of 2014 and then the, the latest one that President Zelensky came to power, you see a very different map, Ukrainian electoral map, where the absolute majority, not just of, of the voters, but also when you look at the map, the, the nation votes more or less as one entity. And this is, this is a big difference, again, not making regionalism irrelevant at all, but actually making it much less powerful and destructive when it comes to Ukrainian politics. And Gwen, I know that you have a particular interest in the regions of Ukraine, so you probably want to want to add something to that dimension. Well, I just wanted to jump in because you said, Serhii, uh, Ukraine has become more more homogenous. I think I would put it like this. I think there has been sort of a growing recognition and also even celebration, I would say, of its internal diversity. And that, I think, comes out in the also opinion polls if we ask about um, identification with the state and the civic notion of Ukrainian identity. And we can really see, as, as you already um, referred to as well, that also in particular since the annexation of Crimea and the war, that that has increased. And I was also going to give this example of Zelensky's electoral victory. I mean, a number of things came together, but nevertheless, that he could be successful across the whole of Ukraine with sort of one tiny exception and a part of the Lviv um, Oblast is, I think, remarkable and, and speaks to this trend. And And because, as I said initially, I think ethnic and ethno-linguistic diversity has, has often been misunderstood and has often been um, seen from the outside and sometimes in election times been, been sort of mobilized um, internally as something conflict prone. But the reality was always, I think, different. But now I think we, we, there's even much more of, a, of an open of so public societal recognition of that being bilingual is, is, a, is, a, is completely normal and being a, a Russian-speaking Ukrainian Ukrainian is, is normal. So both this, this realization is uh, an insight, but also from the outside, I think, has changed and is part of this, this strengthened notion of a, of a civic Ukrainian identity. I just wanted to add before as well on this term independence and when we look at opinion poll data on that, I mean, with, as with many big concepts, I think it's often not entirely clear what people have in mind when that question comes along. And many of the, the surveys we refer to didn't give other options at the same time. So it's a kind of, are you in favor? Or are you against? So what's the alternative? So even people who don't want to answer this question or, or answer no at a particular moment in time and after 1991. Uh, they they might not necessarily see an alternative. So the alternative is not necessarily at all integration with Russia or in some other form of integration in the post-Soviet space. So maybe just those those mm -hmm. two three points. Yeah, you already mentioned the internal diversity when that is celebrated. And that has a cultural spatial component to it. It also has a temporal component to it. And this year there was a lot of engagement for obvious reasons with kind of the first post-Soviet generation coming of age, the first people born after 1991 and way out of university and in the labor market. Um, Serhi, maybe to you, how would you characterize that post-Soviet generation of Ukrainians compared to the neighboring countries, to other post-Soviet and other European countries? I mean, what sets the Ukrainian, if we may still call them young, apart from those? Or where are they actually very similar and it's nothing distinct about being a young Ukrainian in 2021? Uh, one thing is obvious, which is probably in common for the entire post-Soviet space, for the lack of a better word, is that this generation already was born and grew up without the Soviet Union, without the communist ideology. And uh, that, is, that, that is in common. So they're certainly different from their parents and very different from their grandparents. But then the fall of the Soviet Union opened different doors to different republics in which those um, republics were actually going. There was different path, partially in, informed by history, informed by culture, informed by the economic development, dependence or not dependence on the, on the natural resources. And that's where the differences are. Uh, and I would say there is a, would be a huge difference between 
the young generation growing up in Ukraine and the young generation growing up in Russia, for that matter. Again, what we see in Ukraine is the quite vibrant, certainly democratic development and a lot of pluralism, pluralism in, in political terms, pluralism in cultural terms. And that's, that's in my opinion, what defines defines that new generation and makes it actually different, in my opinion, from what we see in Russia or in Belarus today to say nothing about Central Asia. One research question that I have, and I don't know how to approach it, but on the other hand, I have no uh, better better expert, better person to ask it than, than Gwen. And I was interested in what this history of Crimea existing within independent Ukrainian state between 1991 and 2014 did to this new generation. How comfortable this new generation born after the Soviet Union, born in Crimea, who lived in Crimea, how comfortable does it feel itself now in Russia, which has a very different, of course, political political climate, very different tradition, very different landscape. So did those 25 years or 20 years matter at all for that generation? I know it's it's maybe even impossible question to answer, given that we don't have access to the people there, but that's a question that fascinates me. Um, I mean, m more generally, I think your your question points to how accepted the fact was generally that Crimea is part of the Ukrainian state. And I think even before I would go back where we have evidence before 2014, I think that was accepted. One can, however, also say that I think for Kiev, the issue seemed probably prematurely closed. And I think more attention to local and particularly economic developments in Crimea would have probably been on the agenda or should have been on the agenda more in Kiev too. But that none of that explains. And I think that's that's the most important point of what happened in 2014. So this and, and this becomes very quickly now, I think one of these these myths which also have taken hold in broader um, Western or, or European discourse that there was mobilization in Crimea against um, sort of Russian or Russian speakers um, mobilization in Crimea before the annexation. And that was quite clearly not the case. So this happens very quickly and and Moscow uses, Putin uses an opportunity that presents itself after the Euromaidan mass protests and the government change in, in Kiev. But in in hindsight, I think it's it's a very slippery slope how the the, the Russian official rhetoric slips into also thinking in, in European or Western circles as if there was kind of a, a mobilization against this locally and then Russia came in and according to Russian official uh, uh, rhetoric had to protect Russians and Russian speakers in Crimea. So I think that goes somewhere to a saying that, that that didn't happen. There wasn't such mobilization that existed in the early 1990s, but not in in the 2000s. And Crimea was really, as, as you well know, so he uh, completely integrated politically, electorally into the southeast uh, of Ukraine, which we still at that point saw more clearly as an electoral kind of region. If we think of the Yanukovych bloc or, or the party of regions in particular. And there has, of course, been a lot of emigration from Crimea. A lot of Crimean Tartars who are severely repressed have left, but also a significant part of, of the local population. I don't know right now how many young, younger people are among those. I wouldn't be surprised if um, that is the case, that it's uh, younger people who have, have left. They're, of course, also being replaced. So there's heavy immigration going on, settlement going on from from Russia and and also in parts from the uh, from the Donbas so um that is not really a direct answer to your question but uh, i just wanted to highlight this point that it's not um the annexation by russia did not happen because people uh, locally or in the rest of ukraine somebody had doubts about crimea's place in the ukrainian state at that point yeah if i if i if i can jump in i, I completely agree with you and here at uh, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, we have a project called MAPA, and one of the modules there that was developed by uh, Nadia Kravitz was looking at the mapping the attitudes of the population of Ukraine uh, after 1991 toward the ideas of some form of uh, integration with Russia, either having open borders or, or creating one union state. And that research shows, again, based on the polling data, that uh, 
uh, the, the moment where the, the skepticism toward Ukrainian independence, including in the Crimea, was the highest was in the late 1990s. So if the, the Crimea living Ukraine movement would be there and would, have, would come from below, the time for that was not 2014. The time for that was 1999. So clearly this is, this is just one more argument in, in favor of what we actually know and knew that by watching TV, that it is a takeover, that it is an annexation by the, by the neighboring state of a territory of other sovereign states. So the first case of that nature in Europe, I guess, since, since the end of World War II. So we've touched on the significance of Russia for Ukraine, um, uh, but we've also talked about the young generation. And when we think about the young, I mean, part of that post-Soviet generation is, of course, mobility that their parents also couldn't have to the same extent. And young people are well, moving across across Europe and and beyond. And my question would be to both of you, thinking about kind of question of identity and the place of Europe in the discourse of Ukraine, of Ukrainian identity at the moment. I remember when the Euromaidan happened, the French philosopher Bernard-Henri Levy, he went to, to Kiev and he welcomed the Ukrainian people to Europe uh, with an enthusiasm that, that underlined the beauty of Europe that one couldn't find any longer in the European Union itself. And he gave the impression as if Europe really had a strong salience in, in the Ukrainian discourse, or he at least thought that it would be in sync with the population. The two of you, what would you make out of this and the place of Europe in Ukrainian self-understanding as a nation in 2021? Well, I think uh, Europe is, is, is very important in today's Ukrainian identity, but it also was already in, in 1991. And I think the example you give probably shows maybe that parts of the rest of Europe have discovered Ukraine in the meantime, uh, rather than that Ukrainians or Ukrainian historians would have placed Ukraine in that context. It doesn't mean, of course, that this is an either or, so that there are historical linkages in different directions, also people to people links in, in different directions. But I think I would say that that idea of, of Europe was a powerful one. And if anything, it has become even more powerful, partly in reaction to Russian actions in Crimea, in the Donbass, in to what is happening right now. There is just no alternative, I think, for the population at large in, in terms of uh, reorienting themselves towards Russia or integration with Russia is not a, a majority view by any stretch of the imagination, not just the young in, in general. So in that sense, it's uh, having exactly the, the opposite effect of what I think the Kremlin intends. I mean, of course, the war keeps destabilizing Ukraine and, and also drains resources and, and, and refocuses Ukrainian politics. But overall, it has exactly the opposite effect of what, what is the in incentive for Moscow to destabilize or to question Ukrainian independence and the civic state behind it. But what you what you outlined, I think there are many more opportunities now, in particular used by young people, be it through visa liberalization um, that the EU introduced, um, educational opportunities, migration, labor migration to not just the EU, also other other countries, but the EU in particular has uh, is very attractive in that respect. So I think that. The EU is also generally attractive as an as an institution, but over time, not just among the young, but in general also, it can be a source of, of disappointments as well. So I think there was also in parts probably illusions about that the EU would open the doors more quickly to Ukrainian membership or that the whole process of adjusting to what that would mean on the on the EU side not be as long and also as costly as it actually is. So, But that overall, that I don't think affects the idea of being part of Europe and there is uh, no alternative to that. However, I add as a note, Russia is also part of, of Europe. Um, and I think very often we, we reduce Europe to the EU and, and, and I don't think we should do that. Thierry, what would you like to add on the place of Europe? In mm, certainly, uh, Ukraine uh, discovered Europe much earlier than Europe discovered Ukraine. And that discovery happened at least in the 19th century with the formation of the modern Ukrainian identity. Europe was another pole compared to Russia. It was not not Russia. It was an alternative. That was in the 19th century, that continued through the 20th century, and, and it's there in the 21st century. Now, luckily for Ukraine and for Europe as well, the idea of Europe is not associated just with the European Union 
or just with NATO. It is about about the values. It, it is about democracy. It's about the rule of law, and those things are still important for Ukraine today, as as they were ten years ago, or they were in 1991. That being said, Europe, in in the form of its institutions, really left Ukraine in no man's land. Uh, in the process of the expansion of the European Union, in the process of NATO. And there is a lot of reasons, of course, for Ukrainians from that perspective, from that point of view, being disappointed. They're not disappointed yet. They're, they're, they still have high hopes for Europe. And I think living up to those hopes is would be good not only for Ukraine, but also for Europe as well. Well, that's a nice concluding statement. Thank you very much. So I think we've covered a lot of ground on not only the referendum of December, but also its implications, the prehistory. I certainly enjoyed that conversation a lot. So thank you very much to Gwen and Seri for being our guests today. And I hope that you will use the chance to also listen to the other episodes that we have on our podcast on 30 post-Soviet years. There are plenty of episodes to discover. So um, we hope to be able to exchange with you on that occasion again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.